So, I'm about to dash through a whole lot of very important history, forgive me. At the end of the 15th century, that is the 1400s, the great centers of Renaissance art, Flanders in the north, Florence in the south, were conquered by expanding national empires. Even Rome was invaded by both France and the Holy Roman Empire. Spain, enriched by gold from the New World, became Europe's wealthiest power. Meanwhile, the pace of the commercial revolution heated up as wealthy merchants took advantage of expanding worldwide trade, new inventions, and the reintroduction of a money economy. This meant that the base of patronage expanded significantly. The church still commissioned a lot of art, at least until Protestants grew suspicious of church decoration when church patronage fell off in the north. But a rising middle class developed a huge appetite for portraits, for landscapes, and for still lifes in genre paintings, that is, paintings of everyday life. Today we're traveling north from Italy to what today we call Germany, but at this point in our story, what would become Germany, as well as chunks of what would become Italy, Switzerland, Austria, the Czech Republic, and a few other countries as well, were part of the huge Holy Roman Empire. Europe was also heading into the Reformation and the Age of Religious Wars, but not just yet. We'll get there by the end of this lecture. Our first of today's required works was actually completed the year before Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses, that is, his 95 criticisms of the Catholic Church, to the wall of a church in Wittenberg, Germany, and ignited the Protestant Reformation. It's a very Catholic work and therefore serves as a useful contrast to Protestant works we'll examine soon. The two towering figures of the German Renaissance are the Catholic Matthias Grunewald and the Protestant or late-day Protestant Albrecht Dürer. We'll begin with Grunewald. Matthias Grunewald was court painter to the Archbishop of Mainz and he created this altarpiece for a monastic order. The altarpiece was placed in the choir of a church adjacent to the hospital. This is why it features saints associated with disease, especially Saint Anthony, the patron saint of the order. And this is why the altarpiece's narrative message focuses so sharply both on miraculous healing and on the danger of ignoring God's inevitable judgment. Grunewald was a master of the new oil medium, so as you looked at his work, pay special attention to how he used his color subtly to model his figures and shockingly to create contrast between good and evil and the saved and the damned. Here you see the closed altarpiece with its supporting predella, a term you need to know. The closed altarpiece has images of St. Anthony and St. Sebastian on either wing portrayed as painted sculpture. On the predella, we see Mary and her dead son. That's seen as a lamentation or a pieta, just after a deposition or removal of Christ from the cross. These terms show up on college board questions, so you need to know them. Note that John the Baptist appears on the other side of the cross from Mary and St. John. Of course, John the Baptist was already dead at the time of the crucifixion, but Grunewald has chosen to make him symbolically present, pointing to the salvation that he had proclaimed. Sacra conversazione is a term for paintings that portray biblical figures or saints interacting even when they were not alive at the same time. We also see the lamb carrying a cross, another symbol of Christ's sacrifice. These, by the way, are among the elements that will disappear from Protestant Christian art. Protestants did not generally portray non-biblical saints, and they tended to be persnickety about scriptural accuracy. They were less inclined to employ symbolism or to paint chronologically challenged sacra conversaciones. The closed altarpiece presents one of the most vivid and gruesome depictions of Calvary, Christ's crucifixion in art history. Let's go quickly to two close-ups, first of Christ's head and then of his body, and you'll understand why I say this. The Order of St. Anthony operated a hospital in Isenheim, largely for those afflicted by a disease known then as St. Anthony's Fire. It was caused by a fungus in rye and other cereals. Doctors now call that disease ergotism, and thankfully it's become rare. But in this era, periodic epidemics still erupted in Europe where grains were often stored in damp conditions that encouraged the development of fungus. St. Anthony's Fire set off painful skin eruptions that blackened and turned gangrenous often requiring amputations. The eruptions were accompanied by nervous spasms and convulsions. Many of the victims of this disease died. 
The monks treated victims with a balm made from herbs and other plants, and with prayers to St. Anthony, who was believed to possess miraculous curing powers. The monks also tried to bolster the faith of the sick by reminding them that Christ, and St. Anthony as well, had suffered even greater torments. So Grunewald's altarpiece played an important religious and psychological role in the Isenheim treatment program. I know that I've shown you this German Gothic image several times, but note how similar the expressive emotional language of this work is to Grunewald's altarpiece. I could easily imagine the College Board pairing these two works. Heavily emotional content and physical exaggeration will continue to appear in German art well into the 20th century. The outer wings of the Isenheim altarpiece were open for important festivals of the liturgical year, particularly those in honor of the Virgin Mary. The scenes from left to right are the Annunciation, a concert of angels, the Nativity, and finally on the right, the Resurrection. This, by the way, is a computer-aided reconstruction. The altarpiece itself is now displayed in a museum in, in separate parts so that all of it can be viewed at the same time. So hooray for Photoshop. Let's focus on this extraordinary depiction of the resurrection, a scene that actually relatively few painters have attempted. What techniques has Grunewald used to portray this central moment in the Christian narrative? Obviously, there is a very vivid use of color. Note how Grunewald has applied layers of paint to give the scene an almost translucent glow. The use of juxtaposed complementary colors, orange and blue, likewise focuses our attention on the contrast between earthly life and the resurrected life. The painting adds drama, too, with the tumbled soldiers at the bottom whom the resurrection has thrown to the ground. And now we come to another turning point in our course, as we are introducing a new medium, printmaking. The invention that more than any other ushered in the Protestant Reformation, and for that matter transformed much of world history, was the printing press. The printing press spread knowledge and incendiary ideas, such as the notion that people could read and interpret the Bible for themselves. The printing press also created new markets for art in forms that could be easily, and this is really important, inexpensively reproduced. Here's the first major book printed with movable type in Europe, the Gutenberg Bible. Although illustrated printed Bibles would soon follow, these illuminations were actually added by hand. You're going to need to be able to keep all these various kinds of printing straight, but for now, I'm going to focus on two types of printmaking that appeared in this artistic period and in our required works. <clears throat> on the left, you see a woodblock print created by the most famous print artist of all time, probably also the most famous German painter, Albrecht Dürer. The work on the right is required. It's an engraving rather than a woodcut. Note how much more detail the artist can include. Let's watch a Khan Academy video that provides a good introduction to both woodcut and engraving. Pay attention to the advantages and disadvantages of each method. Note that the allegory of law and grace, a required work I'll talk about in my last lecture for this unit, is a woodcut. Dürer's paintings do not appear on our required works list, which distressed me since I think he's one of the greatest painters in history. Dürer was the Leonardo da Vinci of the Northern Renaissance. Like some of his Italian Renaissance counterparts, Dürer was the son and apprentice of a goldsmith, but as a teenager he turned to making woodcuts for the booming new publishing industry. But also like Leonardo, Dürer was a humanist scholar, a mathematician, a scientist, and a supremely skilled publicist who actually made serious money from his art. Dürer took two long trips to Italy and made friends with many of our Italian Renaissance superstars, including Raphael. He helped bring Italian Renaissance mathematical perspective and humanist learning to Germany, but he remained a very northern figure, especially when he embraced Protestantism in the last decade of his life. This woodcut is so famous and such a longtime College Board favorite that I'm including it even though it is not any longer a required work. The woodcut has hundreds of individually carved lines. The carving would mostly have been done by a skilled craftsman working from the artist's drawings, but we know that Dürer sometimes did his own carving as well. The theme comes from the book of Revelation, and the four disasters are death, famine, war, and pestilence. Death is the emaciated old man, famine swings the scales that will weigh human souls, war wields a sword, and pestilence draws a bow. <coughs> 
the engraving, this engraving, note it's not a woodcut of Adam and Eve, is a required work. It highlights Durer's extraordinary skills as an engraver. Crass cross-hatching, again, is the use of perpendicular lines to convey volume and modeling. Here we see Adam grasping the tree of life. The plaque hanging from the branch announced, contains Durer's signature and place of birth, Nuremberg, in Latin. The branch Adam holds is mountain ash, identified as the tree of life in many traditions, including Greek and Norse mythology. Eve, meanwhile, has broken an apple off the branch of a fig tree, go figure, the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Four of the animals represent the medieval idea that all individuals display one of four human temperaments or humors. The cat is choleric, that means indecis independent, decisive, goal-oriented. The rabbit is sanguine, enthusiastic, active, social. The ox is phlegmatic, relaxed, peaceful, quiet. And the elk is melancholic, analytical, detail-oriented, a deep thinker and a feeler. Who would have guessed that elk were deep thinkers? What this image is expressing is that before the fall, these humors were held in check, controlled by the innocence of man. Once Adam and Eve ate from the apple of knowledge, all four humors were activated and innocence was lost. Humans of different temperaments began to clash and individuals gave in to the worst elements of their nature. Sin entered the world. The nudes show the profound Italian influence on Durer's work. Most, North, most Northern Renaissance and certainly most Reformation works do not depict nudes. <clears throat> Durer was also influenced by classical sculpture, and like Michelangelo, he based his Adam on the ancient sculpture of Apollo Belvedere. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison with the Apollo Belvedere. Remember, this sculpture also had a significant influence on Michelangelo. Like Polyclitus, like Leonardo, Durer believed that the perfect human form corresponded to a precise system of proportion and measurements, a canon. Near the end of his life, Durer wrote several books codifying his theories. Here we see his fascination with the ideal form. The first man and woman appear in nearly symmetrical, idealized as opposed to naturalistic poses, each with the weight on one leg, the other leg bent, and each with the one arm angled slightly upward from the elbow and somewhat away from the body. Actually, I should know the contraposto is naturalistic. Uh, so is the symmetria, the, the balance of opposites. But, and this is what is not naturalistic, the figures are not entirely... Uh, correctly posed for nature. Adam's head in particular is twisted at an impossible angle. These details give you a sense of Dora's complete mastery of engraving. I find the cat's fur especially impressive. Let's look at a video from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, courtesy of Khan Academy, that includes some close-ups of this work. This painting reveals another side of Durer's extraordinary drawing and painting skills. Like many Renaissance scholars, he was deeply interested in natural science. I love this painting, so I just had to stick it in. This painting, on the other hand, reveals not only Durer's skills as a portraitist, but also his late-in-life embrace of Reformation theology. Dora was not a Protestant when he recreated our required work in 1504. Martin Luther wouldn't kick... Uh, in 1504, Martin Luther wouldn't kick off the Protestant Reformation until 1517, so there weren't Protestants in 1504. But less than five months after Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, he received a gift from Durer as a token of the artist's admiration for Luther's religious ideas. By 1520, Durer had collected many of Luther's writings, and his art became increasingly Protestant. Now, Durer's art did not attack the Catholic Church, but after 1517, it was increasingly Protestant in that he abandoned the depiction of popular saints, he portrayed the leading reformers and their supporters in a heroic light, and he emphasized the exclusive authority of the Bible in personal and civic worship. This famous painting reveals both the strong influence of high Renaissance Italian painting on Durer's work and his now Protestant theology. Note that St. John in the red robe overshadows St. Peter, the fellow with the beard. And note, too, that Peter is holding his famous keys to the kingdom over the Bible, not over a pope or St. Peter's cathedral. In my final lecture for this unit, we will look at the Protestant Reformation in more detail and explore a required work that is in many ways a theological treatise in